About 640,000 years ago, a massive eruption rocked the land that is now Yellowstone National Park. Imagine the ash that spread across much of what is now the United States. The eruption was 6,000 times larger than the deadly 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens in Washington, D.C., and created a crater 45 kilometers, 28 miles, wide and 85 kilometers, 53 miles, long. The risk of another major eruption in the near future is low, but the Yellowstone region is still volcanically active. Yellowstone has had a lot of small eruptions since then, says Christy Till, a volcanologist at Arizona State University in Tempe. But compared to Yellowstone's long-ago mega-eruptions, these smaller events are like little burps, she says. By studying Yellowstone's rocks, Till and her team found that the process that triggered Yellowstone's last major eruption probably lasted less than a year. Other rocks formed by lava help researchers continue to study eruptions around the world, past and present. Volcanoes occur in specific places on Earth, says Teresa Eubide, a volcanologist at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. In these places, features of our planet's geology allow magma, molten rock from deep inside the Earth, to break through to the surface. Once it does, magma is known as lava. This usually happens when Earth's tectonic plates slide apart. There, the mantle separates and melts, producing magma. For example, that magma fuels volcanic eruptions at the undersea rift between plates that runs through the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. The rift is breaking the surface in Iceland, where eruptions occur periodically. The mantle can also melt when one tectonic plate dives beneath the edge of another. This is called subduction. When a subducting plate dives beneath another plate, it carries water with it. That water can trigger melting. This kind of mantle melting typically produces the most explosive volcanoes, Ubide says. It's happened in several places along the west coast of North and South America. Mount St. Helens is an example of this type of volcano. Other places where the mantle can melt and push up against the crust are places where the Earth is hotter than usual beneath the surface. That's true of Hawaii in the Pacific Ocean. Geologically, it's in the middle of nowhere, Ubide says. But underneath it is the biggest thermal anomaly, and that's why it's vulcanizing. Sometimes magma can get stuck on its way to the surface. It can settle in pockets of molten rock at depths that extend into the mantle. In some places, the magma can persist for tens, hundreds, or thousands of years. But in other places, it can move from the mantle to the crust in a matter of days or hours. Till's team examined reports of nearly 90 eruptions from prehistoric times to modern times. Researchers have found that some of the triggers for eruptions are related to gases dissolved in magma. What happens in a volcano is similar to what happens in a soda bottle, Till said. Like magma, a soda bottle contains dissolved gases. These gases stay dissolved because they are under high pressure. But when you open the bottle, the pressure inside the bottle drops. The gases can no longer dissolve. The bubbles create a big foam, he said. If you shake a soda, you're going to make it explode out the top. When a volcano erupts, it's usually because the gases can't dissolve in the magma and bubbles form. Bubbles can form when new magma combines with an existing pocket of magma below the surface. Bubbles can also form when magma cools and crystallizes into rock. This forms something like molten magma inside the volcano. Eventually, there's not enough magma to dissolve all the gases, so bubbles form. Only molten liquid can erupt. But that won't happen if there's too much rock. So, just as molten magma is too cold and unbreathable, magma with too much rock can get trapped inside a volcano.